What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Classified France 44, a tactical espionage game set in France on the lead up to D-Day. But before we get into all that, to get my usual stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. There's a link below to a video that explains everything I go over, and my Steam profile is public and linked below as well. Now, in the case of this game in particular, it's important that I also mention that I did do a sponsored video for this title previously, and while no review I make would ever be sponsored, I have done a sponsored video for this game. And with that out of the way, let's actually dive into this thing. So, Classified France 44 is, as I mentioned, a tactical espionage game. The premise of which is to build up and establish a resistance network in France right before D-Day, roughly a month or so ahead of time, with the outcome of the invasion being hinged, of course, on our success and or failure, which makes this a sort of alternative history title. And for those not deeply aware of the history of World War II, we are specifically taking on the role of the Jedbergs, or members of Operation Jedberg, which were three-man teams of operatives airdropped into occupied France to do exactly what we're doing here. Sabotage, guerrilla warfare, build up resistance. Though unlike real life, of course, this has many different outcomes. As progress throughout the game is marked as your resistance strength, and based on the resistance strength you have once the countdown for the game ends, you'll get one of many potential endings, one of which happens to, of course, be historically what actually happened. Now with that overview out of the way, let's talk about how you're going to approach this game and what some of that actually looks like. So starting with difficulty. The game has a variety of difficulty modes, three base options, and then an optional Iron Man mode to go along with whatever other difficulty you pick. Our main difficulties though are recruit, regular, or elite. Now most of what this affects is just the health and damage of enemies on top of how impactful injuries are on your team, as injuries have to be cured, otherwise they reduce the maximum health of your units. And then Iron Man is, of course, a permadeath option. Now, I will say, just as a broad criticism of some of the game here, the balancing can be a little rough. There are some missions that are just dramatically harder than others, and there's not necessarily a lot of warning or build up to that, which we'll discuss a little bit, but the difficulty spikes are very real. Now, I've kind of already done this, but let's talk about the story setup and my thoughts on it more specifically. So, story-wise, as I said, build up resistance right ahead of D-Day, the outcome of which is largely in our hands. The main thing I would say here is that the game is fairly replayable thanks to the many different endings and how well you manage to build up the resistance network, but also because some of the characters are unique as well. Each character you recruit is actually a unique individual and not some randomly generated person, and you can't have all of them on your team at the same time. You have to pick and choose. So in addition to those endings, you can have different characters to run through the game with as well, which also varies up some of the conversations and background you might hear. So story-wise, I wouldn't say this game is shocking or anything, as we kind of already know what happens, but the different endings and characters do make it a little more interesting than it might initially seem, though realistically, I don't think it's going to blow anybody away. Which brings us to the progression systems. As you play through the game, you're going to be leveling up, acquiring gear, interacting with factions, and building up your resistance, on top of dealing with enemy progression, such as their increasing levels. Now, on our end of things, leveling up is a pretty straightforward endeavor. As characters take part in missions, complete objectives, etc., they will earn experience, which then gives them access to, of course, a fairly standard skill tree for a TRPG. That is to say, it has four specializations for the base class of that character. These are going to decide what they're good at and give them more abilities to use in combat. Each character can go up to level 25, though, so you can get quite a bit of these, though some, I would say, are certainly more powerful than others. Because this is a tactical espionage game and not an outright combat game, you do have a fair bit of leeway in how you want to spec out each character. In addition to this, however, we are also dealing with gear. Each of your character has outfits they can wear, a helmet, a chest piece, and legs. This can give them things like extra morale or action points, 
and they also have the weapons available to them. The weapon is usually decided by their class, however they can also pick up secondary weapons that can be changed, as well as things like consumable items such as grenades or satchel charges, things like that. And one of the specializations increases the amount of these you can carry, for instance. Grenades, as ever in TRPGs, are devastating and certainly worth a mention. Now, one place you'll be acquiring a lot of this gear happens to be the factions of the game, which are heavily tied to the resistance network itself, but the factions being the Gaullists, Radicals, and the Criminals. As you complete missions in individual areas, you'll be able to increase their strength in a given region, which will increase your reputation with these factions, which allows you to purchase better and more equipment from them, provided you have the supplies to do so. This is a decent way of making sure you get set items and things, as opposed to the mission rewards you'll get from just completing individual missions. And then there's the resistance itself. Now, the meter at the top of the world map here is going to show you the overall strength of your resistance, which contributes to the ending. However, what I want to draw attention to are the individual regions of an area. As I mentioned, every time you complete a mission, you'll be able to increase the region strength for one of the corresponding faction regions. Doing this three times to an individual region activates an extra ability that then tacks on to what you're able to do, such as reducing the time of the cure injuries task, which is very helpful, and thus another form of progression. However, like many TRPGs, the enemies are also progressing, which you need to watch out for. As the campaign progresses and you pick up resistance strength, enemies start responding more and more, becoming higher level, gaining more armor, using better weapons, which makes them more deadly to you. Which brings me to the gameplay side of things, or the gameplay structure for this particular TRPG, which pretty much comes down to, I would say, the world map, choosing which mission to do, and then understanding some unique things such as managing your tasks, reprisals, and then a little bit about the mission creator. So right away, you're going to have to recruit most of your party or your characters available to you. Probably also important to note that none of these characters can actually die on you. If they get injured gravely in a mission, they'll be forced to retreat, at which point you'll still be able to use them. This is mostly because there's not a lot of characters to choose from, and you're not just turning through recruits here. So each recruitment mission you undertake is going to give you access to a new party member, which is how you're going to build out your team from your initial three. But recruitment missions are just one type of mission, you see. You'll be going on a lot of different mission types, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the combat section. The main thing I want to talk about here is picking where the mission is. Each individual mission icon will be situated in a particular region. That's important because where a mission takes place will determine what faction you happen to be helping by doing that mission and thus which areas you're able to increase, which is even more important because some missions are in either or situation or paired missions as they're called because you don't have time to do both of them. So picking one mission over the other and thus helping one faction or the other is an important part of that decision. Another side of this, however, is your tasks. Missions generally only allow you to have up to four characters with you, though there are a couple of exceptions where other people will be helping you. That said, you're going to have characters who are otherwise idle. They can be put to tasks. A little ways into the game, you'll unlock tasks, which are things like cure injuries if you happen to be dealing with wounded characters, aiding factions to gain reputation with them, recruiting FFIs, which we'll talk about shortly, or simply training to increase their level. All of these tasks, however, cost supplies and have a day counter associated with them. Each mission generally takes two days, and most of your tasks will take that as well, though some of them do take longer. One other thing you have to worry about on the world map, however, is the enemy forces, military police, and the Gestapo specifically. These pieces will move around the world map to individual regions using reprisals or destroying resistance strength you have built up. You can earn what are called FFIs or French Force of the Interior units that counter these enemy units knocking them out and preventing them from using their reprisals against individual areas. So you do have to be a little bit leery of what the enemy is doing on the world map as well, though generally I didn't find this to be too stressful. I usually had more than enough time and FFIs to deal with it. 
but it is something you have to watch out for. Now, I want to talk about this here because it kind of didn't really fit into the rest of the review anywhere, and that is the mission creator. So if you don't want to play the campaign all the time or you want to try out just one and done sort of missions, you do have the option of using the mission creator to either play through other people's content or simply make your own. And it adds a little bit more depth to the game that I think makes it easier to jump into if you don't always want to deal with the, say, timer counting down on the campaign. Probably worth a mention here as well, the developer actually did make some one-off missions that are available in this creator as well, so it is not entirely community-driven content. And that finally brings us to the combat or mission side of things. Missions in this game take one of three forms, assault, ambush, or stealth. This is important because that determines what type of mission it is and what your introduction to it is. That is to say, do you start in combat, do you need to set up an ambush, or can you potentially go through the entire thing in stealth? Which is an important time to reiterate that this is a tactical espionage game. While there are assault missions where you start off in combat, combat is usually not the focus. And because of that, in missions like ambush or stealth, if you're not careful, you can be easily outnumbered and overwhelmed. However, assault missions are generally structured in such a way with like enemy waves and things where it's intended to be possible, so those are a little easier. Which brings us to ambush and stealth. Stealth is the easiest one to mention. It's possible to go through, stealth kill every single enemy, and as long as your characters aren't seen, you're not going to get caught. These missions are inherently a little slower than the others, but I did find that they were generally a lot of fun. There's a lot of patrol routes, a lot of things you need to watch out for, noise mechanics even, so trying to make sure you don't get seen alongside a quick save system if you're not on Iron Man that will let you work through it as a stealth game was a pretty fun experience. The sort of in-between assault and stealth missions, however, are our ambush missions. These missions allow you a certain number of stealth kills before things turn into combat. And what's more, the first round things turn into combat, if you manage to get all those stealth kills off, is an ambush round, where you'll get some bonuses to make things even easier. However, the ambushes are where I found the game to be the most unbalanced, let's say. Generally because the number of ambushes you get seems to be somewhat random, and it can be between like 3 and 10, and I'm not sure if this correlates to the exact number of enemies on the map or the challenge or whatever, but there are sometimes missions where you only get like 3 stealth kills before it turns into a firefight, and with the way enemies will be spread out, it just seems unlikely that you'd be able to do this without it being a headache, which means you can go from some missions being a breeze to the next mission being borderline impossible without extreme save scum. In one egregious instance, there was a mission where I only got a couple of stealth kills, but there were about 15 enemies on the field, and the objective was to kill all of them. And mission objectives can be different entirely from what the actual mission type is. But this was late into the game where enemies had very heavy equipment, which meant that in order to do this, I effectively had to save scum my way through it, guaranteeing I would get some criticals here and there. Which was not a good time, and was a pretty bizarre difficulty spike. But generally speaking, they offer you a lot of opportunities to level the playing field in some way, cut off enemy reinforcements, and then engage in combat on your own terms like you would expect from what is effectively guerrilla warfare. And like many a turn-based game, this comes down to the action economy. Reducing the AP of your enemies, taking their turns via the morale system, giving yourself extra turns, or extra actions as it were, which mostly comes down to manipulating abilities and the morale system. Now, at a base level, this particular combat system is a standard action point system. You get a bunch of action points every turn, you have to spend them on movement and your abilities. Items and things can increase the action points you get, and certain abilities will grant action points to your teammates to effectively give them an extra turn. Attacking in any way generally ends your turn outside of those abilities that I mentioned. But then we have the morale system, the thing that makes this game unique, as each character has morale. As they get shot at, or take damage, as it were, their morale gets reduced. But the kicker is that morale is reduced even if shots miss. So if an enemy is attacked regularly, this will reduce their morale to zero, which puts them in the broken state. But suppressed and broken come from reduced morale. Suppressed halves an enemy's action points, thus reducing their movement and abilities. The broken state takes their next turn away entirely. 
And this applies for enemies and you, which has its benefits and detriments, I would say. Now, on one hand, this is a fun way to reduce enemy effectiveness while increasing your own. And in fact, even if your characters get broken, which can happen pretty easily, because even if shots miss, you're taking that morale damage, there are abilities that increase your character's morale, and increasing the morale of an otherwise broken character will give them their turn and action points back on your turn, which means abilities that actually give you your actions back can be incredibly high value. And all in all, without going on forever about it, I think this system is pretty fun due to the variety of weapons you have, the variety of classes and abilities you get to deal with, the different approaches such as stealth, dealing with different enemies, some are actually immune to stealth kills as an example, so that route doesn't always work as effectively as you might like it, and balancing tactical espionage with outright firefights, and deciding when and where to go loud is a big part of combat that I think can be a very satisfying experience. Now outside of the balancing issues I mentioned, I did also want to mention that the game can be a bit slow, which I would say is mostly down to its stealth approach, which thankfully they didn't make the missions themselves very long, but combined with turn-based and stealth tactics where you're taking every turn very deliberately, trying to make sure you aren't seen and set up kills and the like, on top of having to do that for every character on your team and then waiting for the enemies to take their turn, it is generally a pretty slow-paced experience in regards to most missions. Now, the saving grace here is that the missions themselves are not terribly long. But it's definitely got a more slow and methodical vibe to it, which is hardly unique among TRPGs. Now, that does bring me to the Steam Deck section, however, and the Steam Deck experience for this is a bit odd. Officially, the game has a rating of unknown, as Steam hasn't rated it yet, but while you should theoretically be able to play this without too many issues, as it does have cloud safe support and some support for controllers. The current build only seems to recognize mouse and keyboard, and I can't get the Steam Deck controls to work at all, which is obviously kind of a non-starter. Now, I was able to find a developer response on the Steam forums about this, saying that they're looking at it, so, you know, far into the future this might be less of an issue, but as of right now, I can't get anything but the touch controls to work, so hopefully with the developers at least being aware of the issue, support for this might come around eventually, as this genre typically does pretty well on that platform, but it looks like it's a few patches away from working properly, which is a bit disappointing. Though that does bring me to my positives and negatives. So for me on the positive side of things, I would say this game nails the tension and approach to building up a resistance in a sort of guerrilla warfare way. The missions in particular I thought were a lot of fun in this regard, as you never really feel like you're on top of the power curve and can completely destroy the enemy without embracing the stealth and espionage tactics that are at the heart of the gameplay. So as this genre of TRPGs go, it's a pretty satisfying main experience, but unfortunately, I do think it falls flat in a few other places, which is mainly down to the balancing and just the general slow pace of things. Balance-wise, the game's kind of all over the place. Some missions are incredibly difficult, some are way too easy and that happens on pretty much any difficulty you select. Now, the other criticism here is a little difficult to fix, as the game being slow, I think, has a lot to do with the fact that it's supposed to be a stealth-oriented game in a lot of ways on top of its turn-based nature that's hard to do much with. But games have been making a lot of strides in this area to, I would say, make that experience faster and better overall, messing around with things like syncing up turns and swarm AI, etc., and I think this game could improve a lot in that area specifically. All of which brings me to my conclusion. Classified France 44 is a mostly fun experience that leans heavy on its tactical espionage side of things. That gameplay is quite good, and while much of the systems I wouldn't say will really blow you away, as a lot of it is very familiar if you play a lot of the genre of TRPGs, even the tactical espionage thing isn't a first. It is still a fun iteration of those systems, while also giving an interesting look at real historical events and letting you roleplay your way through those on your own even. And maybe it's because I'm reaching that age where a man gets really into World War II, but I honestly had a blast with this one for the most part. 
And what's more, I think there's plenty of opportunity for it to grow and improve. I know they have some plans for some DLC down the line, so we'll see if it actually comes to fruition on that front. But as of right now, the base game is $35, and for that price, I think you're getting a pretty good experience. So it does get a buy from me, which just about wraps up this review. I certainly hope you enjoyed it, hope you found it informative. If you did, let me know how you feel about this game down in the comment section below, which of course means to like, comment, subscribe, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.